Lord, thank you for the opportunity to meet together. We pray, Lord, that we would set aside our own thinking and our own opinions, and we pray, Lord, that we would come to your word with an attitude of belief. We pray that you would teach us from it, that we would grow in understanding, and that we would please you in all that we do. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. All right, so what I would like to look at this morning is I want to look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And this, the issue I want to take up is the issue of whether Ephesians 1 teaches predestination. And so many think that Ephesians 1 teaches predestination in the sense that God predetermines who will be saved, and who will not be saved. So start with me in Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll, we'll read verses 3 to 11, and then we'll go back and we'll look at it verse by verse to understand what it's saying. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and as we go through this, I may just comment on some of the things that people sometimes think. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us. And so people look at that, He hath chosen us. God did some choosing. Well, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. So He chose us before we were born, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Verse 5, having predestinated us, well, sure sounds like we're predestinated, doesn't it? Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace." wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. Verse 11, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, notice, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. So we see predestinated used twice in that passage. We see that we are, that God has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. And so many will read that passage and they will come away with the conclusion that what God did is God determined, I'll save this person, but not this person, this person, but not that person. And people have the idea that God determines whether an individual is saved or not. Now, I want to look at this more carefully and understand exactly what Scripture is actually saying. So start with me in verse 3, and we're going to go through this a little more methodically. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, the first thing to notice there is that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings where? In heavenly places in Christ. The body of Christ has an eternal inheritance in the heavens. That is in contrast to the inheritance of Israel where they're going to inherit a specific parcel of land on the new earth. God has a different destiny, a different place in eternity where the body of Christ ends up. Now look with me at verse 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. The body of Christ... In other words, when you believe the gospel today, the moment you believe the gospel, you are spiritually baptized. You are spiritually placed 
into the body of Christ. You are spiritually placed into the church that God is creating today. Now notice carefully what it says. He hath chosen us, and then it says, in Him. So keep Ephesians 1, but get with me 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21. So we're going to keep coming back to Ephesians 1, but we need to look at some cross-references to understand what Ephesians 1 is, is teaching us. Now again, I'll just say this as context. What the doctrine of Calvinism teaches is God elected, God chose person A and B and C to be saved. In other words, He determined beforehand that they would be saved. They had no individual decision making, no individual role. God chose to save them. And then person D, E, and F, He didn't elect them. The word elect means choose, right? During an election, you choose a candidate. So God didn't elect persons D, E, and F, so they're going to go to the lake of fire and there's nothing they can do about it because God didn't elect them. That, that's what Calvinist doctrine says. Now when you look at Ephesians 1, 4, it says, according as He hath chosen us, and they say, aha, proof. Doesn't say we chose Him, it says He chose us. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Now notice this. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So what God did, what pleased Him, is God chose to save those that do what? Believe. It didn't say it pleased God to save those who were elect. Didn't say it pleased God to save those whom He had chosen. It pleased God to save those that do what? Believe. So who determines whether or not someone is saved? The individual does. Look with me at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 14. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Whereunto he called you, now notice what it says, by our gospel. How does God call people today? By the gospel, according to that verse. People have the idea sometimes that they're going through life and God calls them where God speaks to them and he tells them, you're supposed to go in the ministry or he calls them and you're supposed to move to this place or you're supposed to take this job or this, that, and the other. What Scripture specifically says, how does God call people? He calls them by the gospel, which means how many people have the ability to be saved? All, because the gospel is available to how many? Everyone. So God calls everyone by the gospel, but the individual chooses whether or not they respond to it. Now you know this, but let me just say this. If you believe a doctrine, God chooses person A, but not person B. So person B is going to end up in the lake of fire, and there's nothing they can do about it. What does that say about God? Right? Well, I'm going to choose person A for arbitrary reason that, you know, whatever, because it's, it's not saving them on the basis of their choice, because the way the Calvinist teaches it is God chose them, and God gave them faith. So I'm going to give it to person A, 
But I'm not going to give it to person B. And person B, well, sorry, man, too bad. Life's, life's rough, get a helmet. That's a slander on the character of God. It's an insult to a just, loving God to teach. He saves someone and then just allows other people to go to the lake of fire and they can do nothing about it. Look with me at Romans 3, verse 27. Romans 3, verse 27. Now, while you're turning there, I want to read part of 1 Corinthians 1.21 to you again. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. What that's saying is God was pleased to save people on the basis of faith. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe believe. In other words, could God have chosen a different method for people to be justified? Yes, but it pleased him to save those that believe. Now look at Romans 3 verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works Nay, but by the law of faith. Now, this is an important verse, and let's make sure we understand it. What Romans 3.27 says, boasting is excluded. In other words, boasting is prevented. How? Well, it's not prevented by works, but it's prevented by the law of faith. So here's what this means. If God chose to save people in the following way, could, could, could God have decided this? I will save people, but all they have to do, what I'm going to require of them, is they have to be water baptized, and then they have to give $5 to the church, and then they have to do, they have to go through a class, and so on. If God gave people a list of works. And if you perform those works, you are then justified. How would people react to that? What would they do? They would boast. I'm saved because I got water baptized and I gave money and I went through the class and I did this, that, and the other, and I dotted all my I's, and I crossed all my T's, and I earned it. Wouldn't, wouldn't man say that? That's exactly what man would say. The whole purpose of Romans 3.27 is to make the point that God wanted to exclude boasting. He wanted to prevent it. And if he wanted to prevent it, could he make justification by works? No, because what would people do? They would boast. So consider with me Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works. I, how am I misquoting this? You know, I, I've probably quoted that verse a thousand times. <coughs> Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and, not of, and that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should what? <coughs> Boast. So think about this with me. When Jesus Christ goes to the cross, Jesus Christ has not the blood of men, but the blood of God, according to Acts 20, verse 28, right? If Jesus Christ simply shed the blood of men for your sins, it wouldn't have been enough. He shed the blood of God. And when he did that, he purchased your salvation. What people often say, all too often, God saves by grace... But 
you got to live it. God saves by grace, but if you do this, you lose it. God saves by grace, but you have to do this to prove you're saved. Those formulations, God saves by grace, that is the part that Christ did. He shed his blood on the cross for our sins so that we could have eternal life. If you take that and you then say, but you must be water baptized, but you must be confirmed in the church. In other words, if you add a human work to what Christ did, do you realize how tawdry that is? In other words, Christ died on the cross. He shed the blood of God. He, he bore the punishment that we would have had to have endured for eternity. He did all of that, and God saves by that plus your confirmation? Do you see how ridiculous that is? It's ridiculous. Because if God did that, what would man do? They would boast in their work. So God designed it so that you are saved by faith alone. Okay? Hopefully you get that. God, so what God did is this. Let's be really clear on this. God chose the method that people would be justified by. He decided it's not going to be works. It's going to be on the basis of faith. God chose the method. God provided the payment. The payment is what Christ did on the cross for us. So when you have faith in the gospel, it's not something you can boast in because by having faith, all that you're doing is you're acknowledging, I am a lost sinner. I have no ability to come into a right relationship with God on my merit. The only hope I have is Jesus Christ shed his blood for my sins. He made full payment. And if I trust in what he did, then God counts me righteous. Well, there's nothing about that I can boast in. What, what did I do in that that is flattering to me? I was just a hopeless sinner that accepted the free gift. That's what it is. God designed that method. But he didn't say, person A, you have the gift of faith. Person B, you don't. He didn't do that. That decision... The choice of whether any person has faith is up to the individual themselves. Okay? Go back with me to Ephesians 1 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he hath chosen us, now notice what it says here. It says, chosen us in him. He didn't choose person A and not person B. He chose everyone that would get in him. The choice of whether or not you are in him is up to you. Because the moment you have faith, what happens? You are baptized into the body of Christ. It is completely and totally your choice in that regard. Now notice this. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That's not saying that God determined before the world began whether you would have faith. That's up to you. But did God predetermine the method of how people would be saved? Yes, he did. So think about this with me just for a minute. Before God creates Adam, does God know that Adam is going to fall? Yeah, I mean, he's not surprised. So God, before even creating Adam, has to decide, what am I going to do with my creation that I know is going to rebel? I know that they're going to fall into sin. So what am I going to do? Well, I could save them by works, except their works are going to be terrible, and they're not going to be satisfactory. And anyone that actually did any good works, they just boast about it all the time. And it'd be obnoxious. And so what instead I'm going to do is, because I know they're going to fall, my son will pay the full price for their sin. 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will go pay for their sin. So I'll make the payment myself. And God knew that before creation. But what he decided correctly is this. I'll save them by grace. I'll save them by faith. Jesus Christ will make the full payment. But the one thing I won't allow is I'm not going to allow them to be justified in their self-righteousness. That's what was excluded by Romans 3.27, boasting. So that's what he did. He decided before the foundation of the world that that's how he was going to justify lost man. Now look at me at Ephesians 1 verse 5. Having predestinated us. So is predestination a Bible doctrine? Well, clearly, because the word is there. But here's the issue. Predestinated as to what? So some have the idea, God determined before the foundation of the world that I was going to eat lunch at Wendy's. And God and his wise counsel thought, well, he could eat lunch at McDonald's or he could go to Arby's, but I have predecided that he is going to go to Wendy's. Hooey. There's, there's no verse that suggests anything like that. God does not predestinate where you eat lunch. He doesn't. And in fact, if you study the scriptures, the scriptures use the word chance repeatedly. So for example, as you drive home to church from church today, if someone happens to hit you in a car accident, it doesn't mean God foreordained it or predestinated it or anything. There are just chances that happen in life. Do people have accidents and things like that? And the answer is that they do. So look with me carefully at Ephesians 1.5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. And they say, aha, I got gotcha. you. That verse specifically says that you're predestinated unto the adoption of children. And what that refers to, they say, is you were lost, but then God brought you into his family, and God predestinated your adoption into his family. You being brought into the family of God, you were an enemy, but then God made you his child, and it was predestinated just like that verse says. And what I'm going to say about that is you need to go by what the Scripture teaches and not simply man's wisdom or a sloppy understanding of what those verses say. So let's do this. You ready? If you get a concordance, if you get Blue Letter Bible, and you run a search on the word predestinate, it occurs only four times in the Scriptures. It occurs in Ephesians 1.5, it's in Ephesians 1.11, it's in Romans 8.29 and Romans 8.30. That's it. So if you, say, if you said, well, look, I want to have a scriptural view of predestination, what places would you look? Ephesians 1, 5, Ephesians 1, 11, Romans 8, 29, Romans 8, 30. Now, I want you to notice something with me here. Verse 5 says, predestinated unto the adoption. Go down to Ephesians 1, verse 11, just for a minute. Ephesians 1 and verse 11. In whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. You can decide for yourself. But the predestination in verse 11 is the same predestination in verse 5. It's the predestination unto the adoption. Get with me Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. Now while you're turning there, I'm going to make a point. When you think of the word hand, the word hand, you would normally think 
you know, of, of all of this right here, okay? I'm going to tell you that this right here is part of your hand in the Bible. And the reason I say that is that in Genesis, there is a verse about bracelets for the hands. Now, I would say using sort of my understanding of English, that a bracelet goes on your wrist. It doesn't go on your hand, it goes on your wrist. But when you read Genesis, it'll tell you that bracelets go on the hands, meaning that the scriptural use of the word hand includes this right here, okay? Now, you should check me on this, because I, you know, I, I could make stuff up. So you should figure out if that's true or not. But my point in telling you that is this, As you come to the Scripture, the Scripture will tell you how to think about words that it uses. When it says bracelets for the hands, it's telling you that hands include wrists. Now, the reason I say that, when you think of the word adoption, if you were to just go ask 10 people on the street, what does the word adoption mean? Every one of them would say to you, well, adoption is when someone is not your biological child, but you go through a legal process and that person that wasn't your child becomes your child. And that's what adoption is. And it's not an unusual word, it's a common word. Everyone would know that. We understand what adoption is. It's not your child biologically, but legally you make it your child, okay? Now look with me at Romans 8, verse 23. Romans 8, verse 23. And not only they but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. Well, wait a minute. If you're waiting for the adoption, then you don't already have it. Isn't that more than obvious? Now, notice what it then says. Waiting for the adoption to wit... In other words, that is to say, specifically, the redemption of our body. So the word adoption, our normal understanding of that term is, this person is not my biological child, but I'm going to go through a legal process, and now that person is not my biological child, but now they are legally my child. Is that how the Bible uses the word adoption? And it's not. You say, well, I don't like that. Okay. Okay. Scripture doesn't have to necessarily do what you like. God's in charge. The word adoption specifically refers to the redemption of our body. So let me ask you this. And by the way, it says waiting for the adoption. So here's my question. What is it that the body of Christ is waiting for today? The rapture. Isn't it? So the moment God saved you, your sin debt was completely satisfied. God counted your faith for righteousness. Romans 5.1 says, therefore, being justified by faith. You're already justified after you have believed the gospel. Your sin has been dealt with. You have imputed righteousness. What is the basic problem you have? Well, it's really simple. When you get up in the morning and you shave, you're staring at your own worst enemy, right? You're staring at someone. My inner man is perfect, flawless, kind. You would like him. The problem is he walks around in this guy that's a jerk. Isn't that true? The moment you get saved, there's nothing about your physical body that got any better. The moment you get saved, can you still die physically? Yes. Can you get sick? Yes. Is your body going to decay, right? 1 Corinthians 15 calls it corruption because this physical shell that we have is going to deteriorate and decay. It also tells us that the law of sin resides in our members. 
So the moment I get saved, I'm justified, I'm declared righteous, but the fundamental problem I have is in my members, sin remains. And you know this. If you don't know this, ask your wife or your best friend, hey, do I ever do anything that you think maybe isn't glorifying to Jesus Christ? And the answer is you do. You do because the law of sin remains in your members. So what does God do to solve that? The adoption, the redemption of our body. The redemption of our body occurs at the rapture. Let me ask you this. How many times do you think you will sin after the rapture? You're not going to because you're going to have an incorruptible spiritual body in which no sin resides. Until then, you're going to be tough to deal with. Right? Right? So now look with me at, uh, get with me 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. What I'm suggesting to you is this. The understanding of predestination is simple and straightforward, and God did this sneaky thing and hid it in His Word. And people don't know it because they're not paying attention to what the verses say. Look at me at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. This is a Pauline mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So not every member of the body of Christ is going to die, but will every member of the body of Christ be changed? Yes. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You can see that what happens at the rapture is the dead are raised incorruptible, and those that are alive put on incorruption. They get their new bodies. Go back with me to Romans 8 and look at verse 29. Romans chapter 8 verse 29. Now, what's fascinating, Ephesians 1 says predestinated unto the adoption. Ephesians 1 has two of the predestinate verses. The other two of them are in Romans 8, and Romans 8 is the passage that defines the adoption. It's almost like there was a very wise author that put this together. Look at me at Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, but notice what the predestination is, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now what I want you to notice here. Ephesians 1 described it as predestinated unto the adoption. And we know the adoption is the redemption of our body. We know that's the rapture. Romans 8, 29 says, doesn't say predestinated unto the adoption, but it says predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son. So that raises the question, when are we conformed to the image of His Son? When does that happen? happen. Look with me at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Philippians 3, 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from hence also we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to suggest to you that's a lot like waiting, isn't it? Now notice verse 21. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body? So we have a vile body. It will be changed so that it's fashioned like unto His glorious body. I'm going to suggest to you that's being conformed to the image of His 
son. So let me ask you this. When does your vile body become conformed to his glorious body? It's the rapture. So Ephesians 1 and Romans 8 are talking about the same thing. The adoption is when you're conformed to the image of his son. It's when you receive the redemption of your vile body because it's changed like unto his glorious body. So here's what goes on. Think about this with me just for a minute. The life of a saint during the dispensation of grace can be very different. You can die as an infant. You can die as 100 years old and be in the body of Christ, right? You can get saved when you're young. You can get saved when you're 90. You can get saved and live for a moment and then die. You can get saved and live for 80 years and then die. The experience of people within the body of Christ, there's all sorts of different things that happen, right? God doesn't predestinate all members of the body of Christ to have the same life experience. They just don't, right? Some members of the body of Christ are never born, right? In fact, most members of the body of Christ are never even born. But here's the thing that every member of the body of Christ must do. Every member of the body of Christ has to get a new body. If God took us, what if God did this? I'm going to take Columbus Bible Church to heaven, and I'm not going to give us new bodies. What would we promptly do? Ruin the place, right? Because all we would do is we would sin. And there's all, there's all these people up there in perfect bodies. They're sinless. They're glorifying the Lord, and we're doing stupid stuff. Think about this with me. Does God with the current heaven and earth say, it's good enough, I'll slap a coat of paint on it, and we'll stay here forever? Is that what he does? Or does he decide, wait a minute, the current heaven and earth has been so contaminated by sin that uh, neither I nor my people are going to live there forever. What I'm instead going to do, 2 Peter 3, is the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. Have you seen when, when I don't know, maybe you've seen this. There'll be a, a restaurant and they'll have a building and what they'll do is they'll knock the whole building down and then build a new building right on top of the same parcel. Why do they do that? They do that because the old building has deteriorated so much. Don't try to clean, don't try to just put new paint and you know some new windows in because it still just needs to be done away with, right? It's no longer desirable. That's what God does with this universe in 2 Peter 3. He does the same thing with our bodies. It's not desirable, it's not fitting for us to spend eternity in these bodies. And that is why the sole event of your life that is predestinated is not when you got saved. It's not when you saw the mystery. It's not anything of those things. It is. You must absolutely get a new body because God will not allow you in heaven without it because you would ruin the place. That's what predestination is. It has nothing to do with salvation. One more point on this before we move on. Ephesians 1 says, having predestinated us unto the adoption. Romans 8.23, the very verse that defines the adoption, uses the word waiting. So if saved people have to wait for the adoption, then the adoption cannot possibly have anything to do with salvation. Right? It just can't. So the, the, the typical Calvinist approach 
of saying that predestination is unto salvation or God placing you into his family ignores the words of the text. Because the adoption is something that saved people wait for. Get with me, Acts 16, verse 30. Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas are in a jail in Philippi. And in verse 30, we see what the Philippian jailer does. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer asks the question that it is the responsibility, it is the duty of every human being to solve this question. Right? This is the question you have to get right. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Notice what the response is. And they said, if thou art one of the elect, thou art saved. If you're chosen by God, they don't say that. They tell them to do something. What do they tell them to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The issue that every human being faces that they have to resolve in this life is they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so they pass from death to life. And if they fail to do that, they remain in their sins. Calvinism shifts responsibility for man's salvation from the individual to God. Now, God, provide, God made salvation free and available, but you know what you have to do? You have to grab the life preserver. If you're there drowning and God comes along and he tosses you the life preserver and says, I'll save you, all you got to do is grab it. You know what you have to do? You have to choose to grab it. You're not saved by your strength. You're not saved by your swimming. You're not saved by your merit. But if you stand there and you say, I don't need the life preserver because my works are good enough. What's going to happen? You're going to drown. And it's your own fault. Right? So is there something man has to do? Yes. But it's not a work of righteousness. It's to accept the free gift. I'll latch on to the life preserver. I'll take it. That's the point. Look with me at Romans 22, verse 17, or Re Revelation 22, verse 17. Revelation 22, verse 17. This is one of those verses that, this is one of my favorite verses because it just seems to me so beautiful in what it says. Revelation 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, come, come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Now, what I love about that verse is the spirit and the bride. God is, he, he, he's reaching out in love. He's beseeching, right? He's saying, come unto me. Doesn't the Lord say in the Gospels, come unto me, all ye who are labor and are weary, and I will give thee rest. In other words, it's an invitation. It's God lovingly extending his arms toward man. Come, come unto me. That's what he's saying. And what happened, now notice in the last part of this verse, and whosoever will, does that sound like God chose some and not others? Or is it an invitation to all of humanity? Whosoever will. Anyone and everyone. But you have to will. Now notice what then says. Let him take the water of life freely. Now I, I can't, I just find this interesting. When Eve quotes what the Lord says to them about the trees that they can eat from. 
what word does she leave out? She leaves out freely. Because what God said to Adam and Eve is that they could freely eat of the trees of the garden. In other words, you can eat from any of them. Of course, it excludes the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But other than that, you can eat from all of the trees and you can do so freely. Not going to cost you anything. No obligation. It's free. I, God, that's God giving it to man graciously. Doesn't expect anything in return. With the water of life here, whosoever will, anyone can take it. No conditions, no obligations, no acts of service that you have to perform. That's the way the gospel works. Just th hear me on this. When Adam sinned and man fell, every human being inherited a sinful nature. That's why you have a sinful nature. You get it from your father who got it from his father, etc. And so you're born into sin, you have a sin nature, you have all these problems. And you might think to yourself, well, huh, I just showed up here. I was born with a sinful nature. I can't do anything about it. How is it fair that I have to endure all this and then pay for my sins? And the answer is that what God did, knowing of your predicament, He sent Jesus Christ to make a complete and perfect and full sacrifice, and you can have eternal life freely if you simply have faith in what he did for you. And, and so it's God performing all of this on behalf of man, and all man has to do is accept it. Now let me make the further point of, of this. What happens to, to, let's just use this example, what happens to infants that die before they come to an understanding of sin and understanding of the gospel? What, what does God do? Well, what God does, it's very clear, He credits the sacrifice of Christ to their account. He, because His default rule, His preference is that people be saved. And that's why all those below the age of accountability that die, what God does is He attributes the sacrifice of Christ to their account. But what God also does, because He is a fair God and because He doesn't want robots in heaven, he wants people that choose to love him of their own free will, is he gives you the choice. And what happens with mankind, and this is so tragic, everyone, every human being that ends up in the lake of fire, Christ died for their sins. He, he paid for their sins. And, and all they had to do to receive it was simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what, what, what Paul says in Acts 16, 31. But when man says, nah, I'm good. My good outweighs my bad. I'm basically a good person. God would love to have me in heaven. That prideful, boasting self-righteousness is what keeps people from accepting what Christ did for them. And then they have to pay for their sins on their own. What this should all lead you to is Jesus Christ and God the Father deserve all glory. Think about this with me just for a minute. How many sins do you think, uh, let's say someone lives their full age, let's be 80, 90, 100 years old. How many sins do you think that person commits in their life? Millions? Hundreds of millions? I don't know. A lot, right? How many people do you think ever lived? I've seen an estimate that says about 100 billion. Maybe it's more than that, maybe it's less, I don't know. How many sins is necessary for someone to spend eternity in the lake of fire? One. Okay, so then a single sin is worthy of eternal punishment in the lake of fire. Christ died for a hundred billion people that each committed 
whatever, a million sins. So do the math on that, right? You have this vast, vast, vast burden of sin. God made him to be sin who knew no sin for us. So Christ on the cross, who's righteous, bears countless sins on behalf of mankind, suffers God's eternal wrath, does that all. And all that you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the magnitude of the grace of God is immense. His love is immense. And the fact that man rejects it, man deserves what he receives, is, is, is the bottom line of that. If you're listening to this message, what this should tell you is you are an absolute fool if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't accept the payment that he made for you, then what you're saying is, you, you know, you're, you're, you're just spitting in the face of God. You're just saying, I don't need what Christ did. I'll, I'll take care of it myself. And you will, but you won't like how that turns out. By the way, in Luke 16... The rich man in hell doesn't want his brethren to go there, right? He doesn't want his brethren to go there. So, look with me, and time has gotten away from us. Look with me at Ephesians 1, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Because you are placed into the body of Christ, you are predestinated to receive an inheritance. And the idea of that is this. In worldly terms, some receive inheritances, inheritances and some don't, right? Sometimes there's no money for someone to receive an inheritance because there's just nothing to inherit. Other times there's stuff to inherit, but the parent isn't interested in you inheriting it. Does that happen in human affairs? It does. So earthly inheritances are unpredictable, fickle. Sometimes they disappear. Sometimes they're nothing. Ephesians 1.11, when you are a member of the body of Christ, you are predestinated and you can be certain that you are going to receive an inheritance. You've been made a partaker of the Lord's glory. And that simple fact predominates over, it outweighs everything else in your life. When you think about earth, you know what it's about? You've seen this before. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. No. Whoever dies with the most toys in his loss goes to the lake of fire. Right? How many of your toys can you take with you? None. So everything that's earthly, everything that you can see and touch is going to disappear because the earth itself will melt with a fervent heat. But you have an inheritance that is uncorruptible, that, that can't be lost, and you have that by virtue of being in Jesus Christ. And, and that simple truth should, it should it should affect how you think about every aspect of your life. Now let's look at verse 11 and 12 together. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. In other words, God has a plan. There's something he's working out and he's doing it according to his wisdom. Now notice verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory, 
who first trusted in Christ. One of the aspects of eternity that is glorious is that there's billions and billions and billions of people that are in heaven. They have a right relationship with God. And what should have happened, what justly should have occurred, is they should have been in the lake of fire for their sins. That's what should have happened to them. But the Son of God was so gracious that, that He died for man's sin. And when, when you trust in Him, God credits the righteousness to your account. And then what happens is you have these billions of, of souls in the heavens that are all a testimony to the praise of His glory. Isn't that, you know, just fantastic? Isn't that just wonderful beyond description? I think it is. Let's, uh, let's, let's close with this. Get with me 2 Corinthians chapter 6. As you think about modern life, modern life is busyness. There's work. You know, if, if you think about your life, what you are constantly doing is tending to things that are broken. Right? If you have a car, if you have a house, if you have furniture, if you have a microwave, if you have a refrigerator, if you have a computer, if you have any of those things, what is your job at work? Is your job at work to sit there and, okay, everything's going okay, I don't have to do anything? Or is it there's an endless series of problems that have to be mitigated or addressed or resolved? And it's the hamster wheel of, let me fix this, and then once you get that thing fixed, what happens? There's the next thing on the list. And the list never ends. What I fear, what I think is the case, is people's lives are an endless list of to-do items. And they often don't get the most important one done. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you don't get the issue of your salvation settled, then everything else in life is for naught. None of it matters. You have to get that decision right. So my encouragement to everyone is, if you're not clear on your salvation, you need to be. You need to understand that Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day. You're saved by grace through faith and not by your own efforts. And so you need to Trust what Christ did as the payment for your sins. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to dig into your word. We thank you for the clarity and the, the wonderfulness of your grace. We thank you that you've made salvation a free gift. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to, to teach it. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.